prophecies point to Christ. And some of the messages will go in more detail than others in terms of that connection. For me, I'm just going to hit the ground running and presume that when you read Isaiah 40, 11, you realize that's talking about Jesus. And if you didn't realize that, you may want to read the title of your bulletin that's there about Christ in prophecy and prophecies of the Messiah. That's Jesus. How did he do this? Well, remember uh, the woman at the well? John chapter 4, he finds a woman who had five husbands and was living with her boyfriend. And that was wrong back then, too. It wasn't like a different cultural situation where they didn't know better. They knew better. The woman was a reject then, very likely. And what was his manner with her? He was firm, he was truthful, but he was gentle. He was gentle. Did he set her straight and tell her the truth? Yes, he did. Did he do it in a way that made her despise him? No, he did not. That's the rub. The application is right there. For all of us, whether as shepherds or whether as people just working with one another in the body of Christ, that's the difference. To speak the truth in love. That prepositional phrase is the hard part. Truth I can do. In love, that may require grace. Working in me and between us. He spoke the truth in love. He did not make the woman regret coming to the well. Oh, I met that man from Nazareth. He spoke to her as if she was a sheep without a shepherd because she was. And he gently led her into the fold. How is Jesus with Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue? I mean, these are the bad guys Synagogue rulers, these weren't any friends of the ministry of Jesus, but then there's this Jairus whose daughter was sick. Do you remember how they're on the way to the man's house because his daughter is dangerously ill? And in Luke chapter 8, verse 49, while Jesus is still addressing this other situation that arose there, cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Did Jesus berate Jairus for his fear? No. He found Jairus was a sheep that had been scattered, and the shepherd took hold of him and laid him on his shoulders, rejoicing. Think about how his manner was with these ones that he met. I'll give you a third one to, to finish this thought. Luke chapter 19. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So the people look at Zacchaeus, and they see that he's a sinner, a rich sinner, and worse on top of all that, a tax-collecting rich sinner. And Jesus looked on Zacchaeus and saw a lamb. And so in his response to him, you look at that in the first paragraph of Luke 19, and you will see that the feeder of the flock gathered him in his arm and carried him close. This was not the time for a lecture about Zacchaeus. Why are you a tax collector? Why do you have to give back all that money to people that you've stolen? This wasn't a time for that. Now, there are times for discipline. There are times for chastisement. And Isaiah 40 and verse 11 is not the, the whole of the ministry of a shepherd. It's at least one part of Jesus as the feeder of the flock, that being the key phrase that's there. I'll give you this by way of contrast from Ezekiel chapter 34. The prophet Ezekiel. Now, see, we were in the prophet Isaiah talking about one who would gently lead those that are with young. And here in Ezekiel in chapter 34, now we're finding out about one that would be the shepherd that would come. The one whom the Lord would send as a shepherd. And why he has to send him as a shepherd. I thought the people already had shepherds. They did. The shepherds were abusing the sheep. The shepherds were the problem, not the solution. Ezekiel 34 and verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be meat for them. God himself has to intervene to deal with the shepherds that have been abusing his sheep. I will feed my flock. I will cause them to lie down. Verse 16, this is what the shepherds were supposed to be doing, and you'll hear in this an echo of Christ's commission in Isaiah 40 and verse 11. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. That was the desire of the Lord for his people. 
But what about the fat and the strong? I'll destroy them. I'll feed them with judgment. Do you see how the shepherd can have both roles? The gentleness is for the gentle, the, gar the gathering and the caring for the lambs, but there's a different response in Ezekiel to a different sort of people, to the shepherds that were not doing their duties, who were in fact abusing the flock. To them, the chief shepherd is not gentle. Now I give that by way of contrast, because if you read Isaiah 40 and 11, and you take it out of context, you'll think that Jesus is always little lamb, meek and mild. And you forget that he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that he is also the one who walks in the midst of the candlesticks. And he w is able to remove that candlestick as well. We have to learn from the Lord's example. He did not rebuke the lost for their lostness. He did not badger the broken for their brokenness. And he did not chastise the sick for their sickness. To the men who should have been the shepherds of Israel in the first century, the Pharisees in particular, how was Christ's manner with them? Was he gentle with them? Did he gather them and lead them along? Well, he talked to them one time that I remember. Let's see. Let's listen in. Matthew 23 and verse 24. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a, a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. And I can keep going. Does that, does that sound gentle? Not to them. Not at that time. Nicodemus comes to him in John chapter 3, and Jesus is direct with him, but there's an opening. It doesn't drive Nicodemus off by his manner with him. Nicodemus had shown himself eager, and Christ responds in, in kind. He's the one who's ready to respond in that way. But to his adversaries, that's another matter. He is gentle with those that require gentleness. gentleness. He is forward with the backward, and he certainly disciplines all those that are truly his children. Now, how does this work today? He looks on those that are sheep without a shepherd as being sheep without a shepherd. If you ever wonder why some church folks have misbehaved as they have, and maybe not in every case by any means, but certainly in many cases, this is why. They have no shepherd. They are malnourished, filthy, wounded, and sickly. They may be even stunted in their growth and not be as mature as they should be, and maybe that's because they had no shepherd. And it is true, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is in heaven right now, and we have access to him. But how does Jesus mediate his shepherding? He does it through his servants. He does it through people. Because if you tell me you're meeting with Jesus personally and you saw him, that's a whole other matter, isn't it? He mediates it. He shepherds through his word. He shepherds through those who bring the word to the people. It's no mistake why... The, the word shepherd, if you want to use a Latin form of it, is pastor. It's linked to what other word? One of the kids back in the school, he, he calls me this by mistake. Instead of saying uh, Pastor Dave or something like that, he calls me pasture, which I always think is funny. Little Tommy always called me pasture. Those words are connected. It's the pastor that leads you to the pasture. Don't make me say that again. It's the one who has what's good that brings you to where that good stuff is. That's the connection. There is no shepherding if there is no feeding. Amen. Amen. So when you find that some are in fact very sheepy, it may be because they have not had a feeder of the flock. From a dictionary on biblical imagery, they wrote this, Sheep are not only dependent creatures, they are also singularly unintelligent, prone to wandering, and unable to find their way to a sheepfold, even when it is within sight. Does that apply? Kind of offensive. Singularly unintelligent, prone to wandering, and unable to find their way when where they're going is in plain sight. Have you ever met people like that? Have you ever been people like that? How could I be so foolish? How could I miss that? It was right there. Somebody shows you something from Scripture, and it's not any big, far-off insight they dug out of some other book. It was already there. Singularly unintelligent would be a right summary. Can this description apply to people, to the sheep of the churches? Absolutely. And I'll demonstrate that with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 25 through 28. 
Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Think about that. What has God chosen? Base things of the world and things which are despised. This sounds like people. It sounds like people I've known. In fact, I'll go one step further. It sounds like people that I should know better because they're the ones that God has chosen. Now, why would God show such interest in the unwise and the despised, verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 1, that no flesh should glory in his presence? Jesus never said to the educated, you're too smart, I have nothing for you. They may have gotten themselves into a condition where they can't receive what he has. I don't remember Jesus ever saying to anyone, at least these words, you're too stupid, I have nothing for you. Though there is a, an issue of willful ignorance that I understand, but let's make sure we follow the pattern of Christ in this. Neither refusing the weak nor bowing to the strong, haven't you noticed that pattern in the Gospels when you read? What is the feeder of the flock like? He is the shepherd even when he's before Pilate. He is truth, and Pilate is still asking about it. He's that way when there's a woman by the well, when there's a woman who's caught in adultery in the very act, and he's the feeder of the flock then too. I love this summary of ministry from a man named David Hansen. Nobody pretty wants me now. The world wants winners. Nothing succeeds like success. Look good to attract the good looking. Die to attract the dying. There's an approach that's the first half of this, and that's what he's denouncing. The spit and the polish and the everything to be just the way it should be so we can have a successful church. And I read the scriptures, and they don't point in that direction. They point, in fact, to the despised to those that are not wise in the flesh, those that are not mighty. Many years ago, a man named Philip Keller was a shepherd, and he wrote several books on uh, scriptural themes from that background that he had. Uh, he was a shepherd in several parts of the, of the world, in fact, so his, his experiences are really wide-ranging. But here's just the one thing I wanted to lift from, uh, from that. In all of this, the key to the contentment of the sheep lies in recognizing the owner's voice. When the sheep hear that voice, they know it is their master and respond at once. And the response is much more than one of mere recognition. They actually run toward the shepherd. They come to him for they know he has something good for them. Run to the shepherd. That's where the food is. Run to the shepherd. That's where the good things are. How do you know that you're in green pastures? I asked this question last Friday. Sarah Stoner gave me the answer. You can taste it. That's the experimental part of the beginning, the experiential part. That's the knowing. Amen. To know that you know him, to know that you understand what a green pasture is, what still waters are. Green pastures are an abundance of what is good and satisfying, and still waters are an absence of what is bad and disturbing. Now the feeder of the flock feeds us with his word. With his word. We'll just go through this very quickly because this isn't the main point. He feeds us with his word. Jesus himself, when being tempted, quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is found in Matthew 4 and verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you have at least that. Word is food. Job longed after the word of the Lord. Job 23, 12 in the NIV. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. And it's certainly true that the servants of Jesus seek to feed the flock through the faithful delivery of the words of Scripture. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is all we have. This is all any earthly shepherd has for the church, is the word to be able to bring this. This is the food. And then, that's not all of it, though. And then, 
I remember Abel, the first shepherd in the Bible, Genesis 4-2, is also the first martyr, Genesis 4-8. And could you not say that Cain's violence was motivated by religion? I think to say it was simply sibling rivalry is an understatement. It is the matter of the offering of the sacrifice, and one is received and one isn't. So the first shepherd is the first one to die because of his sheep. That's curious. Jesus, the feeder of the flock, gives us far more than the words of the Bible. He gives us far more than pleasant places in which we take our rest. Come to Revelation chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. What is this that the feeder of the flock gives us? They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. You can hear the echoes of Psalm 23, even in the book of Revelation there. Here, read this from uh, King James. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Do you hear that? It does this all the time. There are places I'm not even going to into the length of this message, unless I I finish early and we keep, keep going. Feed and shepherd are, are almost interchangeable. That's why the translations do that, because it's a word that's bigger than just one English word is going to summarize. That's why they do that. So they have to choose. Well, we can only use one word here, or it just becomes too clouded by all these different things. Feeding them, shepherding them, the same thing. But don't miss this in verse 17. The lamb is the shepherd. The lamb is the shepherd. And so turning that another way, the shepherd is the sacrifice. What does the feeder of the flock give us? What does he feed us? John six fifty one. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus, as the feeder of the flock, he has things to give us. He has good things for us. There are blessings. I don't deny that. But ultimately, what he brings us is himself. And what he feeds us is himself. It is not something he has that he gives to us. It is himself that he gives to us. The bread the feeder of the flock gives to us is his flesh. The feeder of the flock lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is a shepherd that dies and rises again, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. There's a commissioning of the future shepherds in John chapter 21 that I want to spend just a moment with. John chapter 21. This is after after all the hard and ugly things of Good Friday after all the surprising and terrifying things of Happy Sunday, I don't know what else to call it, Resurrection Sunday. After that, he's he's meeting with his men again, and he's there on the shore, John 21, and they've already had their, their, their time of breakfast. John 21 and verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. See, it's not just that he's the feeder of the flock, and that summarizes it. He's passing this on. He has a work for them to do as well. And in our measure, we as far less than Peter and the others, we in our measure have some feeding to do as well to bring the people. What are we to be about? Feed my lambs. What about all the other things that we can be about? What about all the other plans and programs and ways of achieving this and ways of marking that? This is the bottom line. You can have all those other things, and if you miss this, you miss everything. But if you have this, then those other things will will be in their place and in their time. Feed my lambs. And of course, you'll know if some of you are looking at maybe a New American Standard, it says, tend my lambs. They go through this again, verse 16. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, New American Standard. Feed my sheep. 
I like the NIV on that one, take care of my sheep. And why is the shift in the term? Because there's different words here. The first one is more uniquely this idea of feeding. It's the narrower term of the two. This is a broader term in verse 16, the whole idea of shepherding, which includes feeding, but it's a broader term. Take care of my sheep. Verse 17, and they go through this again. Peter being grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Why did Jesus do that three times? Maybe because it was important? There's other reasons, but I think it's at least that. He didn't want Peter to miss that. He didn't want Peter going, Oh, okay, yeah, feed sheep, and what else? There is nothing else. Because that's the key. If you're doing that, you are equipping your saints. If you're doing that, you are fitting them for the battle. You are giving them what they need. You are giving them all the things they need to be effective in their ministries. You are passing gifts on to them. All these things are found up in, in, in really feeding the sheep. Even from the very announcement of Jesus' birth in Matthew 2 and verse 6, you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And that is what he is. He is that one shepherd. One shepherd for the children, one shepherd for the old women, one shepherd for the teenagers, one for the young men, for the parents, for the childless, for the married, for the single. One shepherd for the old men. The young women, the rich, the poor, the healthy, the sick, one shepherd, one food, his flesh. The good shepherd will return for his flock, and he shall call to them, and they will know his voice. He will lead them to the greenest of the green pastures. He will lead them to the stillest of the still waters, and he will come to lead them home.